In the late 19th century, a string of lurid homicides shattered Winnetka's idyllic reputation, prompting the press to dub it Murder Town. One bright Sunday morning, elderly Irishman Kane Higgins crossed through a field in Lakeside on his way to church when someone crept up behind him and struck him with a rock. The old man collapsed in the tall grass. He was then shot to death three times through the neck. His body was not discovered until that evening after his wife reported him missing. On a tip from the town grocer, Charles Goss, police arrested a poor German immigrant named William Schweigart. Schweigart had borrowed Goss's gun to kill skunks, but never returned it. Goss happened to have marked the bullets in a distinct way, and these were the very ones used to kill Higgins. Police asked Schweigart to produce the gun. He said it was stolen. Police scoured the property and uncovered it, buried in the barn. Schweigart confessed to the crime. His motive? Revenge. The wealthy Irishman had hired him to do various chores, but always shortchanged him. Fifty cents here, a dollar there. Whenever Schweigart demanded full payment, Higgins would just laugh at him. The total amount owed? Thirty-five dollars. The defense tried a risky move, claiming Higgins had raped Schweigart's mentally deranged wife. The jury found this implausible, considering Higgins' age and the woman's ever-present protective children. They gave Schweigart life in Joliet. Then in the winter of 1881, a 10-year-old boy was walking through the ravines north of Tower Road when he made a gruesome discovery. Propped up against a tree was a naked, headless body. No one was reported missing, and the authorities had no clue as to who he was. That spring, a group of boys were playing on Tower Road Beach when little Tommy Dwyer dug his hand into the sand and felt something cold and slimy. He grabbed hold of the object, pulling up a human head. The authorities knew the incidents were connected, so to speak, but still had no clue as to who he was or who killed him. Later that year, one of Henry Lloyd's servants discovered a discarded German uniform hidden in a cistern. It had belonged to the victim. Lloyd became obsessed with the case, and after a lengthy investigation, discovered the man was Ignaz Hopf, a former mayor who fled Germany, leaving his wife a cryptic note. I have by power of attorney authorized you to assume complete control of my property. You can do with it whatever you like. My dear Mamie, forgive me for causing you so much pain for my departure. I cannot write you the reason for it, but do not think it's because of some infidelity on my part. The greatest pain I now have is for those who belong to me. Embrace my children. His murder was never solved. But the most sensational crime, the one that inspired the nickname, was the murder of two of the most well-loved people in town, two of Winnetka's founders, James and Mary Wilson. Wilson served as village president for six years. Tall, thin, stately, his long white hair draped about his shoulders, he reminded people of an Old Testament patriarch. He started the first commercial store here on the northeast corner of Willow and Maple, a general store which he ran himself, selling groceries and hardware. There was no bank at the time and he lent money freely, motivated by his desire to see the young village grow. Mary Wilson functioned like the town nurse despite being confined to a wheelchair. Before there were any doctors here, folks brought the sick to the Wilson home. To be sure, the prescription was usually a dose of castor oil or a homemade calomel pill. With few exceptions, the ailing one was restored to health because of, or in spite of, the prescribed dose. Grace Sloat. 
The couple were also recognized for their strong political opinions. Mary had known Abraham Lincoln and had a reputation as a red-hot Republican. Once, she received a gift wrapped in newspaper. When she realized the paper was the pro-Democrat Chicago Times, she threw it, gift and all, into the fire. The couple's only child, George, had been a doctor. During the Civil War, he fought to end yellow fever when he contracted the disease and died. The Wilsons were devastated. I have had days of desolation and anguish and have cried out, what is life that I should desire it? But time dulls the sharp edges of affliction. We must submit to the inevitable. What a wretched existence if it were not so. George's Civil War sword hung proudly on the wall of the Wilson home, a painful reminder of their loss. Every day, neighbor Emma Dwyer visited the elderly Mrs. Wilson to help her with whatever she needed. One morning in February, Emma found the doors locked. This was highly unusual. When no one responded to her calls, Emma broke a back window. She saw Mr. Wilson slump behind the wood stove. Frantic, she ran to get help. When she and a neighbor returned, they discovered that Mr. Wilson had been shot to death. Upstairs, the scene was much more gruesome. Mary Wilson had been murdered in her sickbed, hacked to pieces with her son's Civil War sword. When the young men of Winnetka heard the news, they were certain they knew who did it. Neil McCage. McCage was a raging alcoholic with a violent temper, known for aiming his pistol at anyone and everyone, threatening to shoot them. The same kind of pistol used to kill Wilson. McCage owed Wilson a great deal of money, money he borrowed to start a butcher shop on Elm Street. Whenever Wilson asked him to pay back the loan, McCage became irate and threatened him. The young men of Winnetka charged the butcher shop to lynch him. They might have succeeded if Robert Moth hadn't intervened, pleading with the mob to let him have a fair trial. The murder and subsequent trial became national news. All the evidence, however, was circumstantial and not enough for a conviction. The jury felt compelled to let him go. After his release, McCage closed shop and left town for Minnesota, where less than a year later, he was killed in a bar fight. The truth of the murder died with him. Jesse Prouty. The Wilson home was located right next to the railroad tracks. As trains slowed for Winnetka, conductors announced, Murder Town next, Murder Town. Noses pressed against the glass to view the house, scene of such grisly slayings. The curious poured off the train in droves. Others rode in from the country to glimpse the haunted house for themselves. The house was sold and moved from its original location to Spruce and Green Bay, seen here. It was torn down in 1960 to make way for the AMP grocery store. There would not be another murder in Winnetka for the next 50 years.